Do take your seats, please. Let us begin on time. A good Ukrainian tradition. Do take your seats. Hello there, everyone. I'm Jonathan Isle from here, from the Royal United Services Institute in London. You'll have plenty of opportunities of seeing what we do and who we are during the day today, and welcome to all of you. I should say, first of all, that you've got um, uh, headsets near you for simultaneous translation between English and Ukrainian. English is on channel one, Ukrainian is on channel two. And my only request is please do leave the headsets here on the seats uh, as you leave the room. Don't take them out if you don't mind. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to give the floor now to the Ukrainian ambassador in London for welcoming remarks before our first session begins. Ambassador. Uh, thank you so much and good morning to everybody. And since I am honored, honored to open uh, officially today our Ukrainian week in London, so I think it's a very good time to start and to say thanks to the organizers because we have people who dedicated all their efforts and all their time to make this important event happen today. And first I will start, of course, with the Atlantic Council, with the um, uh, BUCC, this is British Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce, RUSI, who is hosting us kindly today. Also Financial Times, they will be hosting all of you tomorrow. National Investment Council of Ukraine, and also Mironevsky Hriba Product. And forgive me if I will be not mentioning everybody just for saving time, but again, I think it's the very good opportunity to say thank you, because um, in the course of discussion, I'm afraid we will be forgetting about our organizers. And ladies and gentlemen, you know, when I'm saying that this event is very timely one, I'm not just saying diplomatic language. This is, I think, the very good opportunity and the very right time to gather here in London and to speak about Ukraine and uh, the United Kingdom, especially as uh, this country is facing Brexit challenges. And I think we should together discuss what investment opportunities, what trade opportunities we will have both together after the Brexit. And, you know, frankly speaking, as an ambassador here, I know that Ukraine is not some kind of a terra incognita for this country anymore. But at the same time, unfortunately, I should confess that still my country is associated with economic hardships, corruption, war with Russia. And unfortunately, there are only few voices who are saying about the progress of reforms in Ukraine, that the country is really changing. And this is not anymore a post-Soviet Ukraine, which was well known in the middle of 90s. And um, no, in that, in that sense, I think this event is very crucial in order to get out our message about that already the painful reform started to bear fruits, that Ukraine is changing and uh, Ukraine economy now is the economy with growing opportunities, but still some challenges, as I must admit. Today, the top officials from Ukraine, my dear colleagues from the government of Ukraine, will be speaking to you about these reforms, about our reality, about the plans that we have for the future, even irrespectively of the presidential and parliamentary elections, which of course will also pose another challenge to the country. And I know that this discussion will be very frank and very sincere. And I also wish that you will ask as many questions as, as, as you wish. And let's uh, hope that this discussion and this meeting and this whole week of Ukraine in London will become something more, something like a new basis for our dialogue in post-Brexit period. Thank you so much and I wish you all good discussions and very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Karen von Hippel. I'm the director here at RUSI, and it's my pleasure to also to welcome everyone here today uh, for this conference on Ukraine security and its importance to the United Kingdom. 
Uh, we are also delighted to host this in partnership with the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. Ambassador Herbst, nice to see you, as well as the British Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce. And of course, many thanks to the British Embassy in Kyiv and Ambassador Goff, welcome as well. Uh, as the ambassador mentioned, today's event is part of a uh, of Ukraine week here in this country, and uh, there will be a number of conferences and events looking at political issues, cultural issues, and investment opportunities. Um, I think uh, our focus today is much more on the, the security angle, and I think everyone in this room probably does not need uh, to be convinced that this event is extremely important and this conversation is extremely important. Uh, the conflict in the Ukraine has lasted for over four years and there have really been enormous consequences, not just financially, but including tragic loss of lives of civilians and of soldiers. Uh, the international community, as many know, have been trying to broker a, uh, a peaceful resolution to this for many years, uh, even back when I was in the State Department uh, in, uh, a few years ago. And so far, unfortunately, they have not yielded any results. Uh, Ukrainian soldiers and civilians are still being killed in Ukraine, and it's, this actually rarely makes the newspapers, which is also uh, Really, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, it's a tragedy. Uh, this country's support, the United Kingdom's support of Ukraine includes uh, support to the military uh, in terms of training, uh, and also uh, the British government is working very hard on efforts to combat corruption and to promote good governance. And you'll hear more about that later when the ambassador speaks. Uh, I think Perhaps over the day, we may also discuss uh, the concern people have about Brexit and how that may or may not impact the relations between uh, the two countries. Uh, but everything we are hearing me, uh, uh, from our end, there's certainly a consensus on Whitehall that the commitment remains very steadfast uh, and strong. And there's a recognition that, that this is a shared threat and a common threat. Uh, so, to start us off today, it's really an enormous pleasure to welcome the Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration of Ukraine, uh, Ivana klimpush Um and she will be our keynote speaker this morning. She's well known to many people for her, uh, her commitment to reform in the country and to promoting universal values. I don't say Western values, actually, I think they're universal values, uh, human rights, democracy, etc. Uh, she has had a very distinguished career, not only working as a journalist uh, earlier for the BBC, uh, but also she's led think tanks, uh, NGOs, and other activities in Ukraine before she joined politics in 2014, uh, and, and as we can see, she rose very fast to uh, the leadership in her country uh, on foreign policy. Uh, she will, the Deputy Prime Minister will speak for about 20 minutes, and that should leave us time for Q&A. Uh, today we will be uh, fully on the record for her presentation and for the Q&A. So without further ado, Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Karen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, it's a great pleasure to address this distinguished audience today, audience of professionals and uh, um, I hope real friends of uh, our country as well as uh, real patriots of uh, the hosting country. Um, for sure, today we are gathered here for, I think that this discussion today is giving us an opportunity to actually set a bit wider uh, framework for the discussion not only between the two countries, but I think also looking strategically on the threats and all the, on the challenges that we are facing and looking for common ways how to um, commonly and more effectively and more cohesively address all of them. I would like to also uh, use this opportunity to thank the organizers and congratulate them with the uh, start of this four days uh, week of um, a Ukrainian week in, in London, and I'm sure that there will be quite a lot of different um, interesting and challenging discussions that will lead us 
to finding common solutions to those issues that are on the top of our agenda. Let me begin by stating the obvious. We do live right now in a dangerous and pretty unstable time. And this time uh, is when the, um, something that used to be self-evident is somehow um, dwindling at this point, even degenerating at this point. Because in this time, the democracy is finding itself in the, in the um, hands of populists. The freedom of press, freedom of speech is quite frequently finding itself also in the hand of manipulators. Um, this is the time of a historic challenge, and this is also the time of a political adrenaline, if, you, uh, if I may. This is time of fight, and we have to understand that every vote, every idea, every move actually does matter today. The devils of the European history are um, celebrating their uh, comeback, and we have to understand that they are celebrating this comeback via um, uh, via cynicism, which they disguise usually as a pragmatism. They are coming back as booming nationalism, as egoism, as, uh, as uh, indifference. And they are getting inspired, they are getting financed, they are even getting managed by the um, reckless force that is sitting in Kremlin and is believing that uh, it has unlimited power over the, one of the biggest nations of the world, the uh, Russian nation. The hardest thing in this confusing time is actually to um, see the truth and to name the truth the truth. The hardest time in this is, is uh, just seeing the truth is already um, a challenge and is already a courage. Being confused in these times, um, saying that the truth is somewhere in the middle is much easier it is, and it's less costly than actually calling the spade the spade. A spade a spade. And the truth is, the one that we have to objectively understand, is that Europe has never seen um, such a courageous and such a capable and such a motivated uh, and powerful enemy and has not dealt with it, with it uh, till, till this time. So while Europe is, well, quite a few capitals in Europe are still thinking whether to name Russia as an enemy, the Russia has taken that decision for itself already quite some time ago. And in other words, world, the Moscow is dedicating its effort right now to undermine the democratic uh, Europe. And it does so through different, different um, methods. It rattles the uh, self-confidence of Europe, it erodes the unity of Europe, and it conducts direct and indirect attacks in different, in different spheres, starting from cyber and information attacks, and uh, in attempts to dissolve the, the basic value of the democratic norms and principles. And Russia is pushing the envelope farther and farther, and is not getting um, that response that would stop it at this particular point. Unfortunately, we can see that the developments, between the, the relationship between the um, European countries and Russian Federation are developing along the cycle. Some attack, war, condemnation, sanctions, reset, Again, attack, war, condemnation, sanctions, and so on. And there, there is quite a, an appetite right now in Europe, in different European capitals, to actually look for another possibility of reset. And uh, we have to remember, this would be yet another invitation to war. And having that invitation to war, we do not know when and which of the European countries would again attack itself, quote and unquote. And as long as Europe moves in this vicious circle, the time works against Europe. The, times, the time actually works against all of us. We have to remember that Russia has in mind the idea of turning, the dream of turning Europe from a Gulliver to a number of Lilliputs. And we have to understand that it's up to us to, uh, to decide whether this dream will come to at this particular moment. 2019 is a time of elections. It, it, it is the time of elections, is the election year in Ukraine, it's election year in the uh, European Union, it's the year of Brexit also for uh, Britain and the EU, and we all have our 
um, national sets of uh, challenges, but we also have a, ch a common challenge to address. And while in Ukraine, probably, we can count, even though the elections will be hot as hell, we can already see this, uh, that, but we can probably count that openly pro-Russian candidate will not win the elections. But what about Europe? And there, I think the questions are still, are still here. Uh, who will be the next one to ask for weakening sanctions? Who will be the next one to dance with Putin? Who will be the next one to actually bow in front of Putin? And Moscow is just waiting to, to, to see this and, and waiting uh, for next ones to come and is looking forward to this. Uh, Moscow even has a specific word for that. It's coming of the cons so-called conservative revolution. Conservative revolution meaning that the uh, liberal order would be um, uh, substituted by a liberal rule, that the um, liberal mainstream will be replaced with anti-liberal, anti-democratic, nationalistic, and populistic mainstream, the same one as they have in Moscow. And this notion is uh, could have been not imaginable uh, some decades ago, but sadly, it is um, absolutely possible at this particular moment. So what does West have to do? First and foremost, I think it's important that we all open our eyes, that we realize uh, what is going on and that we are not seduced by Russia's lies. Seduction is a fitting description for what Russia does. And uh, really, why to conquer someone physically if you can conquer um, someone's minds, if you can um, ensure, why, why to protect the truth if you can um, pretend that the truth does not exist anymore? And why um, not to use the social, uh, this, the, the era of social networks? And Russia feels they are very comfortable with, the, with Google, with, uh, with YouTube, uh, with Facebook and Twitter. It feels like fish in the water because all those likes, all those manipulations, ratings, follow, uh, followership, um, and views, all of this gets manipulated in all this, um, in all this new uh, platforms. So, we can only imagine what it might mean for the global discourse, and we have to stay alert, because unfortunately, facts do lose their allure, and uh, truth is replaced with post-truth, and words, unfortunately, are losing their meaning, and it is a global threat, uh, a threat that... Um, Europe has to meet with a common response. And this means additional work and effort for every single nation. This means additional work and, uh, and effort for all those who are keeping themselves alert, who are objectively assessing and, uh, and soberly assessing this situation, and who deeply understand the nature uh, of the threat and possible consequences of this threat. And I think uh, those who think strategically, they have to look for common answers on the national level, on, on the region regional level and on the uh, global level as well. Ukraine, since it was, uh, since invasion of Crimea, has been um, ringing these alarms, alarm bells for more than four years now. And as we have to deal with quite a lot of the um, hybrid attacks of Russian uh, Federation, starting from the trade and transit wars uh, going up to the military, open military aggression in the East, and I would probably hear, uh, maybe even um, use this opportunity to correct Karin saying it's not the conflict in Ukraine. Once again, it's not the conflict in our country. It is open aggression of the Russian Federation with um, plenty of times negotiated ceasefire and not having this ceasefire which would be sustainable and would be uh, comprehensive. We, have, uh, we are withholding constant information, disinformation rather, attacks. We are uh, constantly with, withholding cyber attacks on our government institutions, on our uh, critical infrastructure. We are um, dealing also with the um, groups, with the activities of the subversive groups on our territory, and I'm sure that our, my colleagues will be um, addressing these issues in, in many more details. And having to stand as the front of the Western civilization and having to stand up to the uh, to this attacks of the Russian Federation, we appreciate of all the efforts that uh, Western countries have been able to take together in unity 
to actually uh, deter Russian uh, appetite. Uh, and here there is a special, the special role and special thanks and gratitude comes also to the uh, United Kingdom because um, uh, because of its, of its absolutely clear stance towards the Russian aggression in Ukraine. And we are grateful to the UK for uh, training our uh, military, for training our troops. We are grateful for the expert and uh, advisory support. We are uh, grateful for providing equipment, for assisting us with, cap with cap building capabilities um, to enforce um, uh, the efficient work of uh, anti-propaganda activities. We're grateful for um, help in building good governance, in building a better nation, and building resilience of the, of the country. And obviously, we understand that recent events and, and recent um, ac active political discussion and active political um, context between Ukrainians and um, uh, British officials are only helping us to, to strengthen this uh, communication and this cooperation. We are very grateful for the recent visit of the um, Secretary of Defense, Mr. Williamson, to Ukraine. Moreover, he has been the first Minister of Defense of any country that has decided to visit uh, the east of the country where we have the uh, this ongoing hot European war going on our own territory. And um, I'm also very thankful that he has taken decision after that to actually uh, step up the activities of Britain in helping Ukraine to transform, to transform its national, and, uh, national defense and to, to uh, continue uh, your presence, your training presence in Ukraine till 2020 with the Operation Orbital. We do also from our side reaffirm the solidarity with UK in the necessity for, for the Great Britain to actually also react to those challenges and threats that are happening on your own soil. And uh, I believe that it's our common responsibility that after uh, Salisbury um, attack, we have to um, ensure that the world understands that this is the final wake-up call for the, uh, for the Western world, that we cannot let Kremlin get away with this, uh, with this attacks. Because otherwise, next, there will be other countries, there will be other capitals or non-capitals uh, in Europe and worldwide, will, which will be um, through impunity attacked by the Russian Federation. Moreover, the last week, this uh, uh, confirmation in Western, in, or disclosure in Western states um, of the facts that Russia has embarked uh, in this, uh, on a series of major cyber attacks, this new evidence is presenting um, the um, necessity to accelerate uh, the need to bring the justice uh, to bring to justice those who are responsible for bridging the international peace and international rules and international order, and that's where the unity and that's where the common effect uh, and effort is crucial. We from Ukraine can offer our practical experience in that, and uh, we can offer the practical experience in resistance to this new type of aggression. And common action does require uh, a wide range, uh, range uh, to cover the wide range of issues. And here I, th I would mention just the few where I think we have a great prospect to deal with together, because we have to, um, strengthen our efforts in building resilience of our societies. And um, as the US Senate committee, when they, they had their hearings with regard to the breach of the um, American elections, they've uh, come up with the understanding that there is a whole of the government effort uh, needed to, um, to, to acknowledge the threat and to trumpet the threat but there is the need to whole of the society response in order to neutralize the threat. That's exactly how I think we have to move. We have to understand that the states itself sometimes are not capable in addressing all the, all the threats. So we have to engage the civil society, we have to engage the media, we have to engage business in order to be more resilient and more efficient in our responses to those attacks and to those hybrid threats that we are dealing with today. We have to, to enhance 
uh, personal citizens' resilience, and maybe we have to move on to to introduction of the uh, of the media literacy um, classes and and programs modules in our education system. We do have to protect our critical infrastructure, thus also ensuring that public uh, that public private uh, partnership is working more efficiently. Uh, we have to think of the new regulation, of the possibility of setting the rules, how we are, the internationally recognized rules, how we are dealing with the cyber attacks, how we are dealing with the cyber threats, because at this point, we don't have the regulation that would help us to, to actually counter this efficiently on the world scale. We also have to think how we are reforming, transforming those international institutions and organizations that have unfortunately not been able to respond respond efficiently to the threats. So we have to think of the UN, um, uh, of the reform of the UN, of OECE, of the Council of Europe. I'm sure that all of us are clearly seeing the um, um, wrecks in, the, in those ships that we have to take care of and we have to, to, uh, to fix in the nearest time. Also, we have to uh, strengthen uh, the capability of those institutions that have proven um, their ability to capably respond to such um, threats and challenges. And I'm talking right now about NATO. That's why Ukraine is placing great um, expectations in its in, um, and, and great work, carries out great work in terms of changing the country according to the standards of the um, North Atlantic Alliance and uh, is right now in the process of, um, of fixing the dream, fixing the strategic goal of NATO and EU membership in our constitution in this particular, um, in this particular months. Common threats, uh, threats uh, also are um, binding the responsible actors. And I see UK and Ukraine as responsible and sober and objective actors in this, um, in this task. Um, the threats are numerous and um, unfortunately recent events have brought uh, much closer to European homes, to transatlantic homes, the threats that we've been um, facing for, for the last four and a half uh, years. And I think this is only uh, under, underlying, uh, underlying that uh, the threat is not only um, focused on one geographical area. Our common security is best served by coming together through our shared values. That means protecting democracy, that means protecting human rights, that means protecting uh, rule of law. Um, we have to ensure that we are never, never compromising on those and that we are standing up to this aggression uh, in whatever forms it comes. So only firm position of the West and only united position of the West with such partners and as Ukraine will ensure that the international law, the international order will prevail and that we will be successfully moving ahead in the development, in, in the success for our people and our nations. Thank you very much. I'll stand up so I can see uh, the questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. I'd heard that you speak very passionately without notes uh, and articulately, and it was absolutely the case. So thank you for the really interesting remarks. Uh, let's open the floor up. As I mentioned, this is on the record. I think we'll start with John. I remember, hang on just a second. We'll wait till the microphone comes, and please introduce yourself for everyone else. John Wilson, the journalist and member of this institute. <coughs> Ukraine was the first nation to give up its nuclear weapons and has since been invaded. Does it regret that decision? Do you want to take a few at a time or do you want to answer? No, I'll okay. try. Well, thank you very much for, for raising that. Obviously, um, Budap our signed Budapest Memorandum did not ensure that we are secure, we are feeling secure. But I think it's not only about Ukraine. The um, Russian violation of the Budapest Memorandum has actually paved the way for a much more an insecure world in terms of um, uh, non, um, 
non-proliferation uh, non-proliferation of the nuclear weapons and that's I think much more important and much more serious for the whole world uh, because those countries like uh, North Korea or Iran looking at the experience of Ukraine I don't think that they would be interested in any uh, in signing any of the uh, memoranda with any of the actors um, because their unfortunately their uh, security would not be ensured that way as we've learned um, upon our experience. Do we regret? I think it's too late to regret. I think it's um, up to us. We, we've learned our lesson. We do understand that uh, together with others we have to ensure that um, our experience would be learned from. Okay, um, Ewan and then this gentleman here and then Jonathan. Yes, um, oh, Ewan, hang on just a second. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Can you um, introduce yourself to everyone, please? Deputy Prime Minister, um, Ewan Grant, uh, Institute you. of Statecraft. I've worked in EU missions for several years over various periods in Ukraine, including immediately before and, af and immediately after the Maidan. And I, I very much notice your comment in your speech about how Russia's trade and transit disruption started before that. My question really follows on from um, John Wilson's um, question. Um, given that Ukraine is experiencing Russia's various levels of warfare, including high-end warfare, and obviously is gaining a lot of bitter experience from that, are there any particular opportunities for institutions which largely operate outside the military field? I'm thinking particularly the EU, I know it's developing its CSDP, to take that into account in increasing the quality and quantity and value of aid and assistance and cooperation it is giving in other fields. It can't give it directly, because that may be against its constitution or its practices, but it can in other ways. Because I think there's a major opportunity, and I don't think the um, suffering and um, noble actions of your country and your armed forces is getting sufficient credit. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for this question. Um, first, Ukraine values highly all the international assistance, starting th from the political backing and ending with the pr practical um, engagement of different countries and different institutions, helping Ukraine to actually cut finally cut that umbilical cord of the dependence on the Russian Federation, dependence on the Soviet past, and, 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 and remnants of those um, Soviet type of, of um, approaches that we've still seen uh, over the last um, decades in Ukraine. Uh, however, you are absolutely right when you are um, asking whether the West could do more. First and foremost, I think it's important that the West should uh, stop um, questioning whether Ukraine deserves, uh, deserves support. I think, m moreover, it's important that the discussion between prolongation of the sanctions against Russian Federation is or should be cut from the uh, discussion on the support from uh, to, towards Ukraine, and sometimes some capitals are actually trying to suggest that uh, um, the support to Ukraine should be somehow linked to continuation or non-continuation of the uh, sanctions, or the, the reform process in Ukraine should be linked to that. I think we all have to remember, A, that sanctions have been uh, imposed on Russian Federation because Russian Federation has violated the international law, brutally violated uh, international law, and um, impunity would only lead to um, additional um, willingness of Russian Federation uh, to attack other countries. And that's, I think, we are seeing right now the consequences of non-reaction to, or non-cohesive and non-unified and not enough at, um, reaction to the, to the uh, attack of Russian Federation uh, against Georgia back in 2008. 
um, if we reacted better, that, that wouldn't be possible for Russia to attack Crimea. And if we attacked more uh, seriously on Crimea, Russia wouldn't have had um, started the attacks over Donbass. But definitely, I think the EU uh, and I think the other um, international bodies could do much more in supporting Ukraine. Because um, Ukraine right now is, for example, implementing the most ambitious association agreement that the EU has ever had with any third country. Basically, it requires from us uh, implementing about 80 to 90 percent of the uh, keys in in our internal legislation, which means that we are basically following the path of the candidate countries, but definitely uh, the support we are getting on that path is incomparable to what the uh, candidate countries have been receiving from the EU. So on this economic track, on this track of the internal transformation, I'm sure that a lot, much more could be done. And yes, unfortunately, the EU is trying to um, shy off, if I may, from the military uh, and um, uh, defense um, issues that we have to deal with. And therefore, we are here relying on our uh, common efforts with those countries that do understand the uh, challenge and threat much more, uh, much deeper than the other states. So a lot more can be done. Okay, thank you. Sir? Uh, Tom McCain, uh, Associate of the Institute. Deputy Prime Minister, you said that uh, you wanted to embed in Ukraine's constitution uh, the uh, intent to join NATO and the EU. Um, what, what would you say to those uh, who are concerned that that step, uh, joining NATO, would uh, inflame uh, security issues in Europe rather than, uh, rather than calm them down? Thanks, Tom. It's very easy. Ukraine has been non-bloc country, has been new, neutral, particularly fixing this in its legislation when Russia attacked Ukraine. So uh, nothing was done at that particular moment to inflame the security situation from Ukraine. And therefore, Russia does not need additional invitation to inflame the, inflame the situation. It's, um, it's going against, um, along its own logic. And uh, therefore, uh, we also understand that Russia only understands the language of power, the language of unity, the language of decisiveness. And when it sees that the, the other side is behaving that way, then it's ready to listen, then it's ready to, to, um, to address the issues that are of concern for the other side. So therefore, uh, Ukraine joining NATO, Ukraine joining the EU in this particular moment, and I understand that I'm talking in the UK, which is, has taken the decision with regard to Brexit, but you haven't, thank God, taken the decisions uh, <laughs> of leaving NATO, um, uh, that with Ukraine inside, Europe as a wider um, notion will be much stronger without Ukraine, with Ukraine being left in this uh, um, kind of gray zone. I think we are all uh, going to be subject to many more threats and challenges. Okay. Jonathan? Uh, Charles Nahar from here, from the Institute. If you don't mind, I would sort of return to some of the topics that we discussed a few months ago in, in, in Central Europe when you attended the, the security conference, which is your relations with your immediate neighbors. Uh, you've just expelled the uh, Hungarian uh, consul mm. um, for a particular uh, incident that was unpleasant, I think, for both Kiev and Budapest. And we all know Mr. Orban is a difficult person, but I don't want to get involved in that issue. I just want to ask what you think you, Kiev needs to do towards its neighbors, towards its immediate neighbors. Can it do better than it has done now to anchor itself in a closer cooperation in security terms with its immediate neighbors, Moldova, Romania, Poland, with which you have a good relations? And does it pain you that you ended up in this dispute with Hungary? Any dispute is painful, I think, and any dispute is not pleasant. That's um, for sure um, is, I think, for every single nation. However, I think the um, situation that we are finding ourselves now in 
is the result of the fact that Ukraine is gaining um, the place as a subject of the international relations, is gaining the place as the country that understands its national interest, its state interest, uh, its uh, responsibilities as well. And when, um, when it projects itself as, as, a, as, a, uh, as an actor, as the player, then it's not always easy to find agreement with all the neighbors immediately. But I think that, you, that Ukraine has been behaving extremely um, highly diplomatically, uh, extremely constructively in trying to find the way um, out of the, of the dispute that we have with uh, Hungary. But unfortunately, we haven't seen such a, a goodwill from the other side. And we will continue to try to, to do our best in terms of finding the ways how to address the concerns of the national minorities. But I think uh, we have to unfortunately agree that manipulation on the uh, situation with the, uh, with the uh, rights of the national minorities that is coming from Hungary is unacceptable as well. And we have to address this all together. That's why we are asking also all of our partners from, from the EU, from NATO, to um, check for themselves and to, to weigh for themselves how they are seeing this particular issue and how we can sort it out together with making sure that um, the constructive uh, dialogue is restored. Um, I think that Ukraine is very much interested in looking forward with every single nation that is um, our neighbor um, and in building our uh, friendly and, and uh, neighborly, good neighborly relations with every single country. And I think we are succeeding with most of them. Uh, I'm obviously not mentioning Russia here as a, as a goodwill neighbor. Okay, sure. and then we'll go to the side of the yes, room. My, my name is uh, Alan Lee Williams. I'm president of the Atlantic Council of the United Kingdom. and have been for some time. Um, but during the period when I was president of another body called the Atlantic Treaty Association, I made five visits to Ukraine. So I had lots of friends there in the civil society side of the business. But I've always come away a little bit concerned about what's actually, what, what are they doing? And I'd like to have a little bit of an update because uh, the, the leadership seems to be... Um, flexible, it changes quite quickly. Now, it, it may be because of finance, I'm sure that is the, the main reason, since it's a main reason in the United Kingdom too. I mean, uh, the Atlantic Council here is run on a shoestring. Yeah, no government assistance at all. That ceased six years ago. But nevertheless, we've concentrated our activities and are making an impact in universities. So my question, ready to Deputy Prime Minister, is I'd like to hear more about the programs you're running in your own universities because we find that Ukraine is a useful way of talking about our relations. <laughs> and you'll agree with, agree with me on this with Russia and with, uh, with Mr. Putin in particular. You will realize, of course, we're on the eve of some general election in this country. Maybe three years before it happens, but people are talking about it. Okay. And so it's important to, to speak to uh, political parties in this country, especially the Labour Party. They will come in fresh, new. They will need educating <laughs> on the realities of the Soviet Union, uh, the, the, uh, Russia which to them is still the Soviet Union in their thinking. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Can, we, can you take a few at a time? Okay, okay. Um, can we go over here, Saj, please? Um, okay, uh, Lindsay, right here, our colleague from the Atlantic Council. Uh, Adrian Karatinsky with the Atlantic Council. Um, in uh, 1998, I recall a conversation with the freshly minted Ukrainian Foreign Minister Boris Tarasuk in his office when he assumed power. And uh, he, uh, he said, you know, this isn't really a ministry of foreign affairs. This is really a ministry of Russian affairs because about 60% of the time of all of our embassies is spent encountering and dealing with Russian, mm. Russian pressure. So Ukraine has faced 
decades of soft power pressure from Russia morphing into hybrid warfare and so on. Uh, so Ukraine has also had governments that have cooperated with that pressure or resisted that pressure, but gained a lot of experience and resilience uh, in dealing with this. Uh, what Ukraine now faces an election period, uh, and uh, you mentioned interference in the US elections and in other electoral processes. What are you currently doing, and what are the challenges that you face from Russian interference and potential interference in the coming election cycle? Okay, we have two more. Do you want to take some? Mm -hmm. Okay, right behind you, please, Lindsay. Those two gentlemen, yeah. And then the one right behind him afterwards, thank you. Thanks, Robert Brinkley, uh, Chatham House Ukraine Forum and Ukrainian Institute, London. President Poroshenko has said that independence for the Orthodox Church in Ukraine is a matter of national security. Could you explain what he means by that? Okay, and they're right behind you, please. Yeah, thank you. This will be the last question. Maybe, we'll see. Hi, uh, Jack Lawrence and Kiev Post newspaper. I also wanted to ask about election interference. Um, what has Ukraine faced from the Russians in terms of this? Um, how is the Ukrainian government prepared for it? Um, and what can we expect from the upcoming presidential election? Okay, thank you. Okay. We'll start from the last one. What can we expect from the um, next presidential elections? I think the great thing about Ukraine is that Ukraine is a democracy, so you do not know what, <laughs> what exactly will be the outcome of those um, of those elections, and that means that uh, notwithstanding the fact that we are fighting the war on our own territory, we do nourish um, uh, democracy and we do understand how important it is to go through all the procedures according to the to the best uh, to the highest standards of the Western world uh, obviously with regard to election interference uh, or election integrity rather uh, we have quite a set of, of um, um, analytical effort to understand what exactly could be happening and would be happening in our country. We already see the the um, heads of the um, revanchist forces um, actually backed and fully financed also from the Russian Federation um, working actively in the political field of uh, Ukraine. And um, again, here, I think we are facing one of the important challenges that all of us have to address in, in our uh, in our common work, that is finding the, the, this um, very fine line and, and this balance between preserving democracy and ensuring national security. And I think that no, no, no country in the world at this point has the um, uh, real answer to this new challenge that we are all facing. So that's one thing. Another thing, obviously, that we are trying to strengthen our um, cyber protection for the uh, for the uh, Central Election Committee and for the registry of the um, of the um, electorate in Ukraine as well. I'm sure my colleagues from from other institutions would be much more um, ready to professionally address these issues with you at the later stage as well. Uh, also, there is another uh, the not, there is another issue of how you. Um, protect um, freedom of speech and how you protect freedom of press in this particular moment when when there is a, there 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 is a hybrid um, um, attempt to present uh, to present totally anti uh, state not anti governmental but anti state forces playing um, in the field of so called free media. So I think we have quite a lot of challenges that we still have to deal with, and that's why we are working also on legislation. We are working also on, on uh, technical capabilities of the country in to, to ensure the uh, electoral, um, the, the outcome of the uh, elections to be protected highly. But thank you, Adrian, that you've been also mentioning that we have been. Uh, subject to, you've named it very nicely, soft power of Russian Federation. Uh, I think it's about inf infiltration of the Russian Federation um, agents uh, to the Ukrainian institutions over the years, over the decades, and uh, we are still cleaning up the, the um, institutions, we are still uh, building up new institutions, we are still uh, basically um, 
building some of them from the very scratch because they have been deliberately ruined from within over the period of time of the of the previous um, uh, governments and, and authorities. So therefore, uh, all of this work is done simultaneously and that is just to, to explain how um, tough and how comprehensive is the task for Ukraine uh, on its path to, uh, to actually building this um, dream European future for our people inside of Ukraine and at the same time protecting the, the, uh, the state uh, for survival from the attack uh, of the Russian Federation. With regard to our civil society, sir, I think that we've been proud of, of our mature civil society over the last years and I think it has uh, actually learned um, its lessons since, since the Orange Revolution back in 2004 because back in 2004 we we all, after getting out to the streets, we all went back to our work and decided that we can concentrate on our work and then the politicians will deliver, will deliver uh, the results on, them, uh, on themselves. While after Revolution of Dignity, quite a few of us have decided that it's high time to take the responsibility and to start working also, to go to politics, to start working in the government, to, to try to, to actually take this responsibility for the country upon themselves. And I think the incredible things that have happened over these uh, uh, years is that the Ukrainian authorities are incredibly open to the dialogue with the civil society and are incredibly ready to co commonly uh, work on uh, finding solutions to different issues together with the uh, with the representatives of civil society, and I see some of the uh, of my colleagues whom I know who I know for like 20 years, I think, uh, in this hall from the civil society because we work together there, and I'm proud and happy and, and grateful that we can right now conduct our work together for for us in the in the government listening to them and taking their advice upon our actions. So I think the situation has really improved. And yes, universities, that's another task for us uh, as well. Be and that's why we are uh, in the huge and incredibly um, important process right now of, of uh, um, transforming and reforming our education system on all levels. And that also gives us uh, inspiration for the, um, for the um, successful future of the country. Okay, well, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, with, with regard to uh, Orthodox Church, um, well, I think we would need probably a, a small lecture for, for um, on history of the Orthodoxy in Ukraine to because uh, to to explain how we ended up uh, in our own country without the church that would have the um, independence um, and that would be seen as a um, as a legitimate um, legitimate institution from the church hierarchical uh, standpoint, uh, but obviously we don't have time for that and uh, I think um, that we finally, why, why the president says that it's a matter of, na of national security, we finally are getting to, the, to that, um, with, with hope, we are getting to that uh, stage when we will obtain the church that is historically um, le legitimate in Ukraine, that is um, practically, um, th that is practically the, the same way as in other countries which have their own, uh, as, as, that have their own churches in their country. And that means that finally we will not be again having the manipulation of the history in our country with regard to the church, who is the mother church and who is the, the daughter church. And, for, and therefore Ukrainians then will be able to uh, not only to um, pray to, to God in their own churches in, in Ukraine, but also we will slowly um, have lesser impact of the 
of the basically continuation of the Russian FSB on our territory in as a Russian Orthodox Church in on the territory of Ukraine. And that's why it's a matter of, of national security, because finally Ukrainians will be um, having their discussion and their, their communication with God without um, uh, Russian uh, interference and Russian um, um, Ne negotiators inside, mm. so to say. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, very passionately uh, discussing the real challenge that you face. You're really at the epicenter in terms of the Russian threat. And I think other countries that are also facing variations of the threat that you face can learn a lot from what you're doing in Ukraine right now. Um, at RUSI, we have a new modern deterrence program. And we look at exactly what you were saying, the whole of society approach, and how to counter these threats using soft tools and hard tools. Um, so we're really grateful for your time today. And uh, uh, just really want to say thank you again to our partnership with the Atlantic Council and the British Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and the, the British Embassy uh, in Kiev. And uh, thank you mostly to our wonderful speaker today. So thank you. Thank you.